Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today's screencast is going to focus on really America after World War II on the home front. Uh, so in some other screencasts, we're going to focus on how the world is kind of changing for the United States overseas and our role overseas. Today we're going to focus more on what's changing at home and some of the difficulties that America has to deal with kind of transitioning you know, out of a wartime situation into a peacetime situation. So the first thing that we're going to focus on is this idea known as demobilization. So when you go to war um, and you have to try to prepare your country for war, that is known as mobilization, trying to mobilize your troops, mobilize your war making capabilities and your production capabilities um, to fight in a war. Um, and that's kind of like the ramping up of your economy and your military to fight in a war. Now demobilization is kind of the opposite, is trying to ratchet down your production and kind of shrink your military and transition to a peacetime situation after a war. Now, both mobilization and demobilization can be a difficult thing to prepare yourself for war or to kind of transition to a peacetime situation. Now, on face value, you would think, you know, ending World War II, defeating the, the you know, the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan, that's an overwhelmingly good thing, and it is. But it also comes with its difficulties. And one of its difficulties is how do we transition to this peacetime period effectively? Um, there are a lot of potential problems and pitfalls you could run into. Uh, so first you want to think kind of, first thing we're going to kind of look at is really, I think, economically, what are some potential problems that the United States could run into? So I want you guys to think in your head, like, what are some potential problems America could, could run into, you know, trying to transition to a peacetime situation? The number one, I think, economic, potential economic problem is that you have about 5 million or so troops in the U.S. military that are no longer needed as much as they were before. So one of the things you're going to have to deal with is a lot of men coming home who are going to be looking for jobs. Uh, so potentially you could have an unemployment issue um, if you don't handle this situation well. So that's one of the first major economic problems you're going to have to deal with. The second potential major economic problem you're going to have to deal with is transitioning from wartime production to peacetime production, right? There was this huge demand for products during World War II. Now you're going to have to figure out how do we transition to a peacetime situation while keeping employment and not returning to a depression. Because remember, um, the United States before World War II was in a depression, and so like, we don't want to go back into that economic downfall because production has to be cut. So some hard decisions have to be made here you know, on the part of the U.S. government and a part of the U.S. Um, society and military. So first thing that they're going to try to do to kind of open up some jobs is to try and convince women who went out to get jobs during World War II to now leave the factory. So this is kind of an interesting element here. So they kind of tried to convince women, um, a lot of housewives who had never potentially worked outside the home to go out and work during World War II. Um, if you remember, we analyzed Rosie the Riveter and this, these famous posters that they made. Now what they're going to try and do is convince these same women to leave the workforce voluntarily to open up those potential jobs for returning soldiers. Um, now they're pretty successful at this. They're pretty successful at convincing women to leave the workforce. Um, some women don't, but a lot of women do. And so that does open up quite a few uh, jobs within the American um, industries and, you know, essentially um, changes the dynamics of the workforce as well. So like it's not that women kind of come out in World War II and go to work and then they stay in the workforce completely. Some women do, but a lot of women kind of return back and the 50s is kind of like a more conservative, you know, time period for American history. Um, so they're successful at convincing millions of women to leave the workforce. The other thing that they're able to do, um, they're kind of scared about this, you know, what happened after World War One, all of these potential labor uh, unrest, the, the economic panic we had after World War One. Uh, so the U.S. government kind of takes action to help these veterans. Remember, we had the veterans, you know, the bonus army during the, the Great Depression, kind of these potential, all these potential problems that could happen. Um, as a result of a large amount of people coming back into American society from the military all at one time. So America wants to kind of transition them economically and transition them socially. So 
they're going to do really, I think, two major things. The first thing that they're going to do um, is they're not going to bring all of the soldiers back home right away. Um, they, they're going to need a lot of troops to stay in Europe and stay in Asia to transition those societies to a peacetime situation. So they're no longer necessarily fighting active duty warfare in these places, but now they're kind of like um, transitioning them to a peacetime situation, doing some nation building in a lot of these um, societies. And so like they stagger the release of our troops. It's not that as soon as the war is over, all the troops are let go and they're able to come home. Um, a lot of them are kept stationed overseas in Europe, in Germany, in different parts of Western Europe, in Japan, to try and oversee this uh, transition to peace for these foreign powers. So that's the first thing that they do. The second thing that they do is they're going to pass something known as the GI Bill. Now the GI Bill, which is still in effect um, for veterans today, is going to offer a lot of benefits to American military veterans. Uh, and it's going to help them kind of transition to a new life after the military. Uh, and so they're going to offer quite a few different things to veterans. Um, one of the things that they're going to offer um, is free college education. Now, at this time in American history, very few people actually go to college. We're talking about somewhere probably in the range of like 3 to 5 percent of the American population actually goes to college. This is going to offer a lot of people who would have never had the chance to go to a university or go to a school or would have never even thought about that to actually, you know, pursue this and go to school. Now, this has, I think, a lot of different benefits. First major benefit is you're going to get a more educated uh, society, more educated populace uh, from getting some of these people to attend schools. Um, the second thing, however, is that you're also, if some of these people went to school full time, they might, it might also lessen the potential effect on the economy and job competition. So it has an economic effect and a social effect. Um, and so like, th this is a factor that I think plays into a lot of people's decision when they go into the military is that um, potentially after you, you end your military career, you can also get an education um, through you know, your GI Bill kind of benefits. Now, one of the other things they're going to try and do, which is also an economic and a social thing at the same time, is they're going to try and offer a lot of veterans the ability to get um, different types of um, mortgages for home so that they can have somewhere to live after World War II. So they're going to offer special um, you know, VA loans and different um, you know, housing provisions, not necessarily housing itself, but like special mortgages that veterans can get. Um, that's only eligible, it's only that veterans are eligible for these types of mortgages. And that's going to help them to, you know, acquire housing, which is in huge demand after World War II. So America really is, during this demobilization period, uh, experiencing a potential problem, which they saw, I think, pretty well in a lot of different ways. So after World War II, we actually don't go into any kind of economic downturn. We transition to this peacetime um, situation quite well, uh, and we go into a, a huge economic expansion in the United States. So from basically from World War II through like the mid-1970s or early 1970s, that's one of the most expansive economic time periods in American history. Okay, now like I said, a lot of veterans are looking for homes and a lot of people are starting families right after World War II. So you, we're going to talk about this in another uh, video, another lesson, uh, but you know, you have to think, a lot of people had to put their lives on hold for four years because of World War II. And so when they come, veterans return back home, a lot of people are in a hurry to start their lives, get their house, start their family. Um, and so what you see is the expansion of not a new type of living in the United States, but one that was not the common way of living um, after World War II. And that is the growth of suburbanization. So we talked about this once before in our class with the 1920s and how the 1920s saw the original beginning of the growth of suburbs. And if you remember, suburbs um, are defined as kind of an area in between an urban area and a rural area in both kind of like population density, but then also kind of like the purpose. So in a suburban area, it's primarily a residential area. Now, when we think of suburbs, I think a lot of Americans, we think of, at least New Yorkers, we think of uh, Long Island, and we think of like the communities out on Long Island as your quintessential suburbs. And in a lot of ways, 
it makes sense because a lot of the suburbs out in Long Island are your 1940s, 1950s, 1960s suburban growth. Um, and if you go out to these areas, if you look at like this picture and that picture, um, what you'll notice is that, and a lot of people will make this comment when they go to certain neighborhoods, is that all the houses look the same. Now, there's a reason for that. That's not by accident. Um, so if you look at what happens in post-World War II America, you have a lot of developers who are not just going out and building a house or two houses. What they're doing is they're going out and they're building like entire communities because they know the demand for housing is so high that you know they want to go out and build an entire neighborhood, an entire community. So most famous of uh, these developers is a guy named, his last name is Levitt. So if you've ever been out to uh, Levitt Town in Long Island, it's named after the developer who built um, the entire town. There's one in Pennsylvania. Um, so it's not the only area that he develops. But what they do is they buy like a big tract of land, huge tract of land out in a community, and then they develop it and build a neighborhood. Um, and so if you go out to Levittown, so my sister happens to live out in Levittown. If you go out to Levittown, basically every single house is designed exactly the same. Now over the years, you know, it's been 70 years since Levittown was built. Um, people have added on to their houses and changed their houses a bit, but the basic structure of it is exactly the same in every single house. Now, you have to think, why did they do this? And what principles are they applying? They're doing it for... Um, Efficiency, one. Cost, two. Think of it kind of like they're taking what we learned about what they did in the factories um, and tailorization and that whole idea of the assembly line and everything kind of like um, interchangeable parts. They're taking that and they're moving it into like home production. And so essentially they're building all these models of homes exactly the same uh, in order to, one, bring the price way down, but two, also to bring their profit up. Uh, and so people just, they wanted somewhere to live, an affordable place to live. And this really offers that. So think about like what Levitt and these types of developers did, similar to like what Henry Ford did for the car. He made it affordable to the average American. Look at this price, about $11,000 um, to buy your house. Now, what is that in our current money? That's somewhere in the range of probably like fifty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars for a home. Think about that: two, three-bedroom home, sixty-five thousand um, dollars. The houses by our school um, in Fresh Meadows; those houses are probably about seven hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, talk about affordable. And not only that, from veterans, as the poster kind of implies, you don't even have to pay for it up front. You could just pay on a monthly basis, kind of like you would pay rent, sixty-seven dollars a month and you could own your own home. Um, so a lot of Americans kind of saw the growth of suburbs as a good thing, like the best of both worlds. They got the countryside um, and they got like the convenience of a city kind of living you know, in these suburban areas. And so more Americans today live in suburbs than either urban areas or rural areas. So that is the most common um, you know, residential place to live in the United States. Now, some people would disagree and say that suburbs are kind of like the worst place or the worst of both worlds. Um, so it kind of just depends on your perspective here. Americans of the era are really interested in moving out to these areas. They want to get out of the cities um, and they want to live in a more family-friendly, uh, family-based communities. Um, now, one of the things that I think goes hand in hand with this is kind of the development of um, like transportation out to these places because if you you really can't live out in somewhere like this unless you could get to work and kind of like be able to travel so um, President Eisenhower who was our president in the 1950s is going to um, spearhead this new act called the Federal Highway Act that builds the interstate highway system throughout the United States so if you ever travel long distance across the United States this highway system was built um, you know, during this era. Now, there's really the big reason for it, Eisenhower says, is for protection for the United States. In case of you know, some kind of military invasion from a, a foreign power, our main uh, enemy at the time is the Soviet Union, we could easily move troops to defend ourselves. But what it also does is it facilitates transportation um, and commuting to different job locations across the United States with a lot more ease. Okay, so um, we're going to kind of stop there. Uh, and 
uh, you know, as part of this, I want you guys to try and analyze some different elements of, you know, this move to the suburbs and what it means for Americans and for the United States.